Hi guys and welcome to VR Essentials where we talk about the practical uses of virtual reality. Now today I am super excited because I'm here to introduce a brand new show called Meta Business podcast. You'll get to learn directly from leading studios as well as indie developers what it takes to build a VR, AR or XR app as well as the marketing, the business development, the funding and a whole bunch of other golden nuggets. Now there are some timestamps below so you can skip directly to the questions and answers that you want to know more about but today who better to kickstart the show than Cluj Interactive who have released one of the most popular VR fitness apps called none other than Synth Riders. So we'll, we'll be talking to Pau, the marketing director of Cluj Interactive, as well as Rural, the product and community, as well as QA testing manager of Cluj Interactive. And we got nine other shows, guys. So do make sure you hit the enable bell after you subscribe because you'll be getting to learn a whole bunch of things from your VR, Sucker Punch, Carly and the Reaper Man, Last Samurai, Walkabout Mini Golf, Arvore Studios, Pico, and a whole bunch of other guests. So guys, without further ado, let's roll the tape. Okay, so at, as we as we uh, swiftly start, um, thanks guys again for being on the call today. Powell, uh, perhaps you could start, uh, just give a brief introduction of who you are, what you do, and then followed by uh, by Will. Hi, hello, I'm Pavel. I'm a marketing director here at Kluge Interactive. Um, and yeah, I live in Poland, and uh, I used to, do some VR marketing for basically since 2015. So early days before, you know, like before Quest, before uh, mobile VR in general, uh, early, some early times. And then, yeah, I joined Kluge first part-time and now for one year I'm, I'm full-time here, uh, making sure that people hear about uh, our, our like flagship title, which is Synth Riders, a VR rhythm game. Awesome. Okay, and uh, and I'm Wirral. I live in South Australia in the Barossa Valley, and uh, I'm product community and QA for Synth Riders uh, for Kluge Interactive, and um, I joined the team full-time. I'm actually promoted through the community, so I actually have been playing the game since 2018, since December oh. 2018. And um, behind the scenes, started doing a little bit of work here and there on a few parts of the game. Started through the QA path and uh, joined, joined the OST team as, as doing QA. And then proceeded to do part-time um, part product management and, and community work. And now basically full-time product community QA. So I look after testing the game on uh, all the different headsets that we port to. So yeah, I was going yeah. to ask you what, what QA stands for, for those that perhaps yeah, uh, aren't familiar with that. So yeah, all the quality assurance, both for for mapping and as part of the, the OST team, the people who map the songs, the map essentially choreographing the songs to, to music and looking at the game itself. So when we port to the PlayStation um, as, a, as a player with, um, you know, 14, 1500 hours in the game, um, I've got a pretty good idea of how the game should feel on all of the different platforms that we port to. So that includes the Pico Neo, um, the PlayStation VR and uh, PC VR and Quest platforms as well. So yeah, it's a very cool. broad, broad description. <laughs> Not many places have those three roles um, tied together, but because Kluge is a very small um, multidisciplinary team like everybody has has a, a, a nominal title my nominal title is product manager but we all have multiple functions because we are a small team uh, yeah cool awesome and um now you guys are spread all over around the world um how how has techn technology helped you to you know keep the projects going and everything compared to before you know pre pre-covid times how many countries are we up to paul no Oh, sorry. I was I was trying to work out <laughs> before because we we have London, New York, we have uh, British Columbia, we have East Coast and West Coast United States, we have Australia, we have Poland, we have Spain, we have Venezuela, wow. we have Ecuador, we have um, where else have we got? Um, I want to say Panama. Um, oh, really? Wow. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So the the team we have a large contingent here in South America. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we have, yeah, East Coast, West Coast. So, yeah, it's a very, very... Um, how challenging is it to synchronize everyone and how do you manage to 
to keep a, a smooth sail sailing, smooth boat sailing? Um, we have we found what we call our sweet spot, and it's usually usually Powell and I that do the compromising. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm the early bird, and he's the, he's the the evening um, when we when we do need to bring the three main time zones together. And we do tend to schedule everything in in PST, so in in Los Angeles time. Um, mm-hmm. But we have these good windows of overlap. So right now, for example, is a is a window where Powell and I often overlap. Um, and, you know, at this time of the day, we sort of check in with each other. So. Um, Uh, having having lots of different time zones, I think, is both a plus. Uh, it can be it can be a plus if you look at it in the right way. It it gives us a huge spread of coverage. So um, when most of the the US team goes to sleep during the day, um, I'm I'm around. So if so, so it's like you're working 24 hours. Is that yeah, what much. you're trying to explain? Yeah, pretty much. And we wind up with this, right. this huge amount of coverage. And um, as long as the team the team tends to break into smaller. Um, partnerships that like two or three people who work together on a project mm-hmm. and that project then works out their own time um, that, that suits them a lot better so yeah cool. it's a challenge but it works <laughs> Paul maybe you can give us a little bit details about uh, Cluj what you guys do are you purely focused on uh, the apps you're releasing or you're doing other things oh yeah so originally Cluj was uh, a design studio um, it still is yeah, in At least a part of it, but uh, it was it was used to be all about you know like web design, some mobile design, um, and then at one point uh, the one the creative director of the studio, together with one of the programmers, they started working on uh, basically Kluge opened this kind of uh, what was the name of it like a lab was it the Kluge the lab? lab. Yeah. yeah, like Kluge Lab that allows right. people to experiment with new stuff mm-hmm. and you know, like devote some time to, to more less for clients, more like passion or like uh, like creative projects. Mm-hmm. Uh, not saying the one for clients are not creative, they definitely are. Um, and they s- started working on a couple of prototypes of, uh, of VR titles, and one of them was Synth Riders. And this one was then, it was showcased on some of the events and people uh, reacted very well to it. So, it so this is early, well. early prototypes? Yeah, that was, it used to be an early prototype. And then uh, it came to the moment it was ready for the early access release on Steam. Um, and st- st- back then that the team was still small, but then the, Things started to accelerate um, at all possible like aspects. Uh, so the team started to grow. The team that's devoted to the game, and also we kept adding new stuff, uh, new modes, new music. Right now we have um, the game is fully released, of course, on Steam. It's also on Quest. It's now on PlayStation VR. We have big titles when it comes to music. We have big artists. We have Muse. We have The Offspring, Bad Religion. Uh, more exciting stuff coming. Uh, so, and then the transformation had to uh, happen around the team, around Kluge, uh going from you know, the service side to the product side. It turned out that actually we have a product that that we have to uh, keep developing and, and maintain. And right now we have a, a, a there, there are a couple of unreleased projects that we are working on that are like product projects or like. Actually, right, so, you, so you still do product research development uh, because also you have Chess Club that no uh, Chess no, Club no, no, with no, one else. So you, you're yeah. purely doing uh, synthesizers at the moment, plus another couple of things that you might release uh, next year, so to speak. But the actual service side uh, that's that's gone now. Not not entirely. It's still there. We still okay. have some some project and some projects and clients on that side. Uh, but also what's happening is that some of the people from the service side are mm-hmm. getting inv- involved in the VR or product side of things. So it's a very nice transformation process of getting more like, for example, everyone got Quest headsets. Like So all the members of the team right now have access to VR so they can join, even like join meetings in VR. Uh, or at least you know, like play games, play synth riders, play other play other titles, uh, and we there's there's a lot going on. 
over there. So, so it's very exciting, but nothing that's public. Mm -hmm. Um, so well, obviously this title started off as a demo, uh, as, as a experiment, as you could say, uh, what was been the most challenging part now that this is a really, you know, full fledged, uh, kind of game. So what, what are the areas that you found, uh, you know, were quite, quite tough to develop? It's, it's a little tricky sort of when you grow a product, the more organic, you know, a, a product is, you, you get to the point in the, the software cycle where you go, gee, I wish we'd done that differently <laughs> earlier on, but you can't go back. You know, the genie's out of the bottle, so you can't uh, go can back. You, can you mention some examples? Um, looking at things like, like the way that the mechanics of the game work have made some things that we've chosen to do dif difficult down the track. Right. For example, the rail mechanic, which is such a, an awesome thing for the game, um, made doing things like spin mode where we needed to take those rails and then spin them through 360 degrees or warp them. Um, the transformation maths involved in, in taking a bunch of points in a spline and, and rotating those is 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 very complicated, right. <laughs> very complicated to do uh, in a timely fashion and make it compatible with every other part of the game. So when you start to try and do different things with a mechanic, you think sometimes, you know, I regret that. <laughs> we regret some of those decisions made early on. And, and had you known that that was something that you wanted to do down the track, you would have done things differently um, in the beginning. Um, the, other, the other part of it too is um, as, as a product gets bigger and, and, and more um, more popular with your players. Um, the players take a lot of ownership of that and uh, sometimes they take it in ways that you didn't necessarily expect and it can be, there's lots of things you can't anticipate as part of your design cycle. So um, the players do things with the game that you go, hmm, I never really thought that, that they would take that mechanic and work with it in that way. Um, and, and you can't change the mechanic. Um, now that's how it is. <laughs> that's that's right. how it is going forward, and and how right. you manage those expectations of your players, who um, who enjoy playing the game in a particular way. So it's, it's that whole balancing act. So what know. what are some of the compromises you had to make? Um, compromise on on the, the constant compromise, and, and we do do this very consciously, is about making the game um, easy to play but hard to master. And that's a really tough balance. So um, right. when, I first, when I first started playing the game with my player hat on back in 2018, um, this was sort of just uh, relatively, say probably about the first five months or so of the, of the game's life. Mm -hmm. um, it developed a reputation for being brutal, absolutely right. brutally punishing <laughs> and, and really hard. And, and a lot it of was. things, it was, it was tough. Yeah. Um, a lot of Beat Saber players would come across and say, no, I can't, I'm a master, you know, I'm, a, I'm an expert plus Beat Saber player and, and this is just too difficult. And it was the combination of the, the, the multiplier, which the creative director believes incredibly strongly needs to be the way that it is, despite all the pressure from the player base saying, no, you need to, you need to recruit the multiplier a lot more quickly and you, you need to not be so brutal with that multiplier. Um, it's a design decision that the creative de director said, no, this is something that we want to do. We don't, we're not making it another game's mechanics. We're making our mechanics and having that, that, that line in the sand. But having to, to take the game from um, being closest to the point scoring and having very tight colliders to being more relaxed and then using a zone scoring system as a compromise that, that had to happen because if you didn't make it easy to play, no one would play the game and you, you wind up in a, in a place where you don't have any new players playing the game, which is a problem. But finding that, that point where you say it's easy to be able to play, but if you want to be able to do well, it's going to take a lot of practice and a lot of skill um, is, is, is one of those sort of the compromises that we had to sort of find over time. And, um, and I really do think that, that this was bef probably before I joined the, the dev side of the team, um, but being around it, I think it was done particularly well and it has definitely stood the game in, in, a, in a good good place now. Had that decision not been made at that time to, to change the mechanics, I think the synth writer's fate would have been very different. Right. Um, pa, I'd like to, to know a little bit more about the art direction um, and how it's helped the marketing um, you know, for, for synth writers because obviously it's got a very retro kind of look going for it. So maybe you could talk to us a little bit more about its inspiration, why you went in that direction and how it's helped the marketing part. 
Uh, I, I think Will should should answer this one too. Or like, I'm not <laughs> sure. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> like, like answer together. <laughs> <laughs> one, two, go. <laughs> um, so both both um, Abraham and, and Jan, so Abraham's the, the creative director and, and Jan Savayos is the lead developer. And since Brothers was essentially a two-person show here, you have, a, you have an art director who has a particular visual style. And if you ever look at any of his work on, um, on YouTube, you can find some of his uh, tilt brush artwork. That art style that he has really does show through in synth writers. And he comes from, a, from quite a heritage of visual artists in his family too in Venezuela. His mother is, a, is an amazing artist. She's incredible. And this, this love of particular art style has come down through the family. And then Jan on the other side, um, the two of them love the 80s, like being born in, in, in the 80s and having lived through this experience uh, with movies like Tron and, and Back to the Future being incredibly influential um, upon, upon these two guys. They wanted to build an environment where their dreams as children would be realised in VR. That was the aim with Synthritis. It was this, this dream that they'd had as kids of what the future would look like and it's come through in the art style. So, so Jan doing the, the coding to essentially make Abraham's artwork come to life. And you can see it in the stages. If you look at the, um, the Through the Sphinx's Gate stage, that is the Sphinxes from, from Never Ending Story. There's a, there's a scene in the Never Ending Story where, where there are these two Sphinxes and basically <laughs> that is totally inspirational in, in that stage. So, right. yeah, it's, it's essentially the realisation of childhood dreams is, is a lot of what that, that art style is in synth writers. And then as to how that's helped, um, helped you, Paul, <laughs> that's, that's a question. It's a great question. Yeah, so, so it's, I think it's clear that we, the, the marketing side reacts to what it's doing on the, on the creative side inside the game. So there's not much, there's some feedback coming from, you know, like that direction from marketing to, 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 to how the game looks, but it's, it's limited. There is so much, it's just taking, you know, like there's so much amazing stuff inside the game that you can use. Um, so... I think that interesting thing is that f when you look at our cover arts, because every time we have a big update or a new music pack, we um, we do you know like we refresh the store assets. So we have a new cover art or hero art. We have of course a new trailer, um, new screenshots, and basically the cover art is usually based just on a screenshot. So rather than you know like trying to you know like Photoshop stuff. From 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 you know, like going from marketing like we need this and that. What happens is that uh, Ivan, so the creative director, he just takes uh, screenshots inside the game uh, based on the new you know like new stages that are uh, or new experiences that are being added, and then th that becomes a background or like a layout for for the for the for the store assets that we have and also for the trailers. So yeah, it's just making the, the most out of what, what's there. Um, and, and I think also the interesting aspect is that initially the game used to be just uh, synthwave music, I think. When we launched the game, it was just a couple of synthwave songs. And right now we have 54 songs in the base game and 25 extra songs uh, that you can buy. And it, it goes from, you know, like, of course, a lot of EDM and synth, but then you have electro swing, um, even punk rock, some rock music. Um, so there's a lot of diversity there, and uh, it's 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 quite a challenge to 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 make sure that the message is clear that this game is also for people who are not you know like huge fans of synthwave in particular, um, and how the game the game changes. And that's what also do you think? One of the reasons. Yeah. Go ahead. What do What do you think this game? Uh, uh, why Why do you think this game was such a hit? Um, I think, of course, the core mechanics, that that the, the gameplay itself, the gameplay loop is is very satisfying, and then it was the fact it was a devel the development was a community driven process. So when you, I know like. 
a lot of people say they 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 are they they are doing it, but we actually it, you can see that in, in this case it was really how it went. So when you develop the game reacting to uh, what what's the feedback from the community of the players, uh, then you can make it keep making it better. Of course, some some it, it some might be like bad decisions, so we have to be super careful uh, because people have like super like someone might say it's it's too difficult, it's too easy. Uh, so we have to find the balance. Uh, but I think that's the, the core idea behind early access uh, on Steam, this feature, that you launch something as early as possible whenever you have something to share with the players, and then you let the process be shaped through, through the feedback. Uh, right, so you, you encourage inviting people to try your things as early as possible so that you can develop it with the feedback of everyone else. Yes. And I think that was key here. Right. So the thing and having, coming having a really rapid, um, really rapid iteration cycle as well. Very early on in the life cycle, um, the Jan as a as a developer is a is a master at rapid iteration. He's he is incredible. Um, quite often, he's solved a bug before I've even finished getting the feedback from the users about what happened. That's how <laughs> he's already solved it. Got a build. It's ready to go into test. You know, before I've even finished talking to the players. So. Um, having a rapid iteration and deployment cycle has been such a huge bonus for us and it's really helped us to to quickly get on top of things, to quickly test things. And we've sort of taken that community approach. Um, like I can remember, again, as a player in 2018, that was how I first met the team, how I first joined the team was, was by actually talking about things that in my play experience that I felt were getting in the way of fun. Initially, just for, for a way of history, um, when you failed the the single hand special or the double hand special sections, the moment you dropped one of those notes, the notes became dim and you were not allowed to play them anymore. Right. And and for me, that was like, why? Why are you not letting me play anymore? This is ridiculous because I have to stand here for 20 seconds looking at my watch, not being able to actually play the game. And that was my, my first, first piece of feedback to the team was you really need to you know, just drop the special, but let me actually be able to continue to hit the notes and give me the haptic feedback and let me recover uh, from the point of missing a note. So right. it, it, it proceeded from that point. It really went into, um, you know, very, very fast iterative cycles and having very close contact with, with players. And, and we pulled that through. Now we run, uh, we have a, a public, well, we should say, it's, it's, I call it a, like a closed beta group, which is made mm -hmm. up of community players who uh, have all or put their hand up and said, yes, I want to be involved in testing. And so we're able to to do rapid deployment now where it goes through through the QA uh, and then goes straight into the, the public group and they have three or four days to, to roll out the patches and have a try just to get it across a broad number of systems and then get it out into the wild. So having that rapid iteration backed up by good community testing is just gold. It's um, it, it means that we're able to get things out there fast and the players really do love being involved if you can engage with the community well. They really do. Yeah, and mm -hmm. I'd like to emphasize something that you said, Real, that uh, from your experience, there was something that was standing between you and the fun. Yep. And this is also a key um, I guess advice you can give to anyone who's developing games that you have to follow the fun, uh, basically. And this is some, there are studios like, for example, Blizzard, they had this project Titan. Oh, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if you remember the name of it. Uh, and they developed it for like five years with hundreds of people and then they just canceled it because they couldn't find, find fun. And uh, that, if you have fast iteration and you're like, willing to share early with, with the players, whether it's closed or like open um, way of, of, of sharing it and then getting feedback, then you can clearly see if people are having fun playing your game. And if there's something you can change to improve this experience or whether it's just not a good idea because you can have a great, something may sounds great on the paper, but doesn't, just doesn't feel that, that great. Mm -hmm. um, as we're talking about feedback and stuff, it'd be interesting to know from you guys, uh, because obviously from when the game first started all the way to now, it's changed a little bit. Things have been added, but also uh, it's been more and more distributed, which means more people have been able to try it, uh, which in turn means you must have gotten more feedback uh, over the last couple of years. So 
uh, how have you been able to manage all these people giving you feedback and also how has the feedback changed from before to to today ah what an interesting question <laughs> um I, i'm i'm really kind of fortunate having grown through the community um It is, it is both a good and a bad thing. So having come through the community, um, I've got a really good good handle on on where to go to get the feedback. And so I'm all the, – the running joke is that, that I'm everywhere and, yeah, I am. Um, feedback coming through, you know, Twitter, Reddit, Facebook, um, through, through our Discord and through the um, modding community Discord, plus about three or four other smaller community Discords that sit on the side. You know, everywhere there's an opportunity – I just put my hand up and, and make myself available. And that actually is what the creative director did in the very early days as well. He made himself incredibly available. So that's something that we do. So being able to gather feedback, um, having a couple of well-defined methods to gather feedback. So we do that through our main website, which actually backs straight into JIRA. We have a JIRA system, which, which takes any, any people who go to the, you know, the, the website and log a form with us, which is you know, a request for support or, or, a, or a bug report or a, I've got music for the game that I'd really like you to put into it. That can all go into, into JIRA. But the rest of it we mostly do through Discord. Um, Discord is an, is an amazing tool. It's very, it really supports our rapid iteration process. It lets us have great conversations and be really, really close up with, with the playing community. You know, they know they can just come in and just, just tag us in, in Discord in our, in our bug report channel. They can leave wishes in the wish list. And then the wish list then goes into periodically, it gets, gets pulled together. And then prioritized into yes, we're going to do this, or no, we're not going to do this, or or no, we're not going to do this right now, and 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 what the impact will be. So we kind of sort of manage the the, the life cycle that way. Um, what's been really interesting is the game has had three distinct life life cycles now. Um, the first life cycle was PC VR, and those those players are incredibly engaged in Discord. They really do. They just pick it up. And as a player base, they're also prepared to put in effort and tolerate a lot more um, technical difficulties, <laughs> I want to say. They, they definitely are very, very patient. I've, I seem to find that PCVR players tend to be incredibly patient. The second life cycle are Quest players, and they do, do tend to gravitate towards Facebook. And you, you need to know where to find them, and they, they do gravitate to Facebook. They also are used to the instant on nature of VR, which is very, very different to PC VR players. And so their tolerance for problems is not as high. They, they're not really as interested in doing um, troubleshooting and, and problem solving where PC VR players will, will fall over themselves to help you do this. Quest players are kind of like, you broke my game, <laughs> give me a refund. Bring it back. You know? <laughs> yeah. Um, Then the third iteration, and this is one, a community that I'm really just getting to know, which is the PSVR community. So they're early adopters. They're early adopters like the PCVR group are, but they have some of the aspects of the Quest players and they have the instant on. But they're also used to working within the constraints of a platform. So they tend to be, they have the tolerance of, of your PCVR players, but they have some of the attributes of the Quest players as well. And they're they're hybrids. They are, they are. And they're, they also, uh, they tend to gravitate to Reddit. Reddit seems to be where we find a lot of, a lot of the PSVR players. So it's really right. interesting having these, these three different groups of people. The PCVR and Quest players have meshed beautifully. And uh, I think there's definitely a lot of overlap. But yeah, now we're trying to welcome the, the PSVR players into the community as well and just see... You know, every time we, we, we go through these different life cycles, it changes the, the community and it changes the game and how the, how the community can grow to embrace the, the, the new players and what they bring to the table and their new attitude uh, is, is really quite good. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's fun. It's all a, all a learning experience. But, yeah, so just making sure that you are everywhere as much as possible. I know some, some studios like to try and um, condense that. So some people like to try and say, if you have a problem, you bring it to me through this one channel. But the reality is that that's not what players are going to do because players will find that one point and they, they won't use it. They'll, they'll go and talk to other players first. So from our point of view, it's actually better for us to have our feet in these communities and be on the ground and be able to, to head off any misinformation and to be able to get early warning and to make sure that those communities know that it's okay to talk to you. Um, 
it's something that's really, really important for us is to be approachable and to say, hey, look, we'd, we'd rather you talk to us. Talk to us here. Talk to us where you are and, and we'll come to you. So what, what, is, what are some of the things that they've told you that's actually had an impact on the development of synth writers? Um, I think accessibility is something that, that I, I think about a lot. And so, you know, you have players who say, um, can you tell me what is the best possible color scheme I can use? I've, I've got red, green color blindness. What is, what is the best possible color scheme that I can, that I can use? Or I'm, I'm finding it really hard to, to see the notes. Um, I've got a vision impairment and it's really difficult for me to, to, to see the notes against the background or, um, you changed the stages in, and you did a graphical update, but now they're completely unusable for me. So these sorts of feedback about visual changes, which we pick up through different areas, have led us to do things like um, talk to particular players before and bring them into our test pro process before we do visual changes or do the most recent change we made, which is to make every single note have its own texture. You can set an indiv individual note texture uh, as well as individual colours. So for people who have um, have colour blindness where the colours may not suit they can also use note texture to help improve contrast against particular backgrounds um, little things like that so just you, things that you wouldn't pick up any other way people would just go oh well that's just how it is I won't play it anymore or that's just that's just how it is I'll live with it but if people feel comfortable to be able to say to you hey is there something that I could be doing differently or something that I could be doing better to improve my experience we can go well actually there's not now but you know what? We really should do that because it won't just help you. It'll help everybody. Um, yeah, so that, that's the kind of things. Just getting that feedback can actually have an impact in, in – in, and it can just be a small thing. It can be a very simple thing that actually winds up having a benefit to, to more players than, than you'd think. Now, now VR is a little bit more widely distributed throughout the world. There's a few more million people in it. Um, and also more people who I thought it was very interesting what you just explained about the PC VR and also the differences between the Quest and PSVR uh, users. Uh, now, P PC VR people, to my knowledge, are a little, little bit more intense and a little bit more uh, savvy and, and techy and, and, and all these kind of things. That Quest people are more, I would call them, I wouldn't say they're iPhone people, but, you know, people who would play apps on your phone kind of, kind of way. Um, did you think that, you know, uh, for example, the, the, the color scheme in Synthrider is, is pretty psychedelic. Um, did you think that it would cause an issue for motion sickness and all these kind of things, uh, headaches or potential, I don't know, just things occurring um, that you had to adjust when you port it to uh, the Quest platform? I would say we think about this, this quite, a, quite a bit um, because we do have people in our team who are um, light sensitive and um, like I'm, I'm someone who doesn't like to have a huge amount of light. So, um, the approach that I always have when it comes to lights and, and, and effects is if you want to be able to dial it up to 11, make sure you can dial it down to one. Um, everything that you can turn up, you should be able to turn down. And that is our eventual aim is to be able to make it easier for people so that you, if you want to have, <laughs> if you want to play in prismatic mode with, mode with uh, the, the massive rainbows and the giant sparks and the everything flying off, good on you. If you want to be able to turn all that down, Good on you. You know, we want to make sure as many people as possible can play the game. And accessibility can can also just be comfort and making sure that everybody has an option for comfort. So um, when pointing to the Quest, is it's an interesting thing you sort of talk about the, the Quest because the Quest 1 and Quest 2 are quite different in terms of the colour palette. Uh, same with PCVR. I find the PCVR palette, colour palette, depending on the headset you've got, like whether you've come from an OLED to a, an LCD type display, it's quite different. Um, yeah, I find, I find them quite different to play on. When it comes to, to Quest versus PC VR, I've got a little saying, which is that every Quest player is a PC VR player in waiting um, once they decide they want more fidelity. So it's it's about making sure that you, you give them the taste of, of where you can go and you make it easy if they, if they want to try the higher fidelity experience. So like we're cross by across Quest and Oculus PC VR. So when you plug your Quest into your PC, when you do happen to get a, a, a PC that's capable of running PC VR, um, you don't have to buy the game again. You already own it. And you can just run the Oculus native version of the game and you can get the high fidelity graphics using the Quest, uh, Quest or the Quest 2 via the link. So that's a, that's a good thing. Um, but yeah, it's, and definitely 
it's interesting when we look at Quest and PCVR by themselves because we have this concept of custom stages. I don't know whether you've seen any of the custom stages or not, but it's possible for our community creators to um, make new environments for the game without modding the game. They don't need to mod the game in order to do it. It's completely supported. And this can be done for both Quest and PCVR. And in particular, the community has created some, uh, I want to call motion sickness stages and vertigo stages. So these are stages that the community provides for free to anybody who has vertigo from some of the, the stages that may be included. They can just go and grab these and store them into their game and find their feet are planted firmly on the ground. And they may also be a high contrast or low vision stages. There's also green screen, chroma key stages, all sorts of things. So so where there are things that we may not be able to do as a, as a studio, the community is also really good at, because we've given them the tools to be able to do that. The community is really good at also stepping up and, uh, and, and filling that need um, where we need to as, as well. So, and, and again, we look at that and go, oh, there is actually a need for that. Then that's something that we can take into, into the future. And yeah, certainly. Hmm. Uh so some of the questions will probably go back and forth because I'm talking to two different department heads here. Uh, so very sorry if, uh, if you feel that's what's happening sometimes in the interview. Uh, will, I'm going to, uh, sorry, uh, Paul, uh, I want to ask you, you, you recently just released for the PSVR, right? So uh, what, what are some of the steps that you have to take to prepare uh, before you start launching a game? And how long does it take? Uh, how, how long do you, do you start planning uh, before you, you would launch uh, the game? game on playstation vr we yeah, can talk so about the psvr because you just launched it so i think it'd be very relevant to to talk about that but you can answer whatever you however you wish yeah okay so with playstation vr you have to make sure you take your time like you plan you, you i guess you you have to estimate the time needed to to port and to to, to publish and then double it, I guess, maybe even, uh, because there are things that you're not aware of when you start the process. So the thing with PlayStation VR is that the closer you are to certain uh, milestones, the more thing you're going to learn about requirements. Um, so I was per personally pretty much very much involved in the, the publishing uh, process. So like making sure that the configuration, you know, like the, the metadata, images, uh, all the store descriptions are there. And um, it scales up pretty quick when you have more items. So definitely, in our case, if, if you have a game with many DLCs, like a rhythm game, in our case, when we have 25 songs and we have bundles and special editions, these are all uh, individual assets that have to be provided with um, sets of images that are localized and description that is localized to 15 languages. So you can imagine 38 items per 15 languages. Uh, you have to produce these items, uh, you know, like produce images, and then you have to upload all of them um, so there's a lot of work there and uh, the documentation, I heard about things that there was someone who spent a year just studying the documentation <laughs> on the PlayStation side to uh, the, the documentation for PlayStation Store and PlayStation 4 platform and PlayStation VR specific requirements. So there's a lot of it. So we have to prepare for learning all of it. And then the, the, the porting process, that depends. I, I think in our case, it wasn't that long. And our programmer, Jan, uh, did a, a, a tremendous job. Um, so it, so he, it was real, I'm not sure if you know mm -hmm. how many months it took. I'm not sure, because I know he was working on it asynchronously around the other stuff. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, it was yeah. less, than, less than 12 months. I, I think we, I want to say around about that five to six months in between all of the other stuff that he was doing. It was, it was sort of five to six months to, from the time that we, and it, part of it was when Sony really started to make more noises about, yes, PSVR is, is, a, is a going thing, you know, that we, we sort of had these concerns that we weren't sure what was going to happen with the platform. 
so that at the moment that that Sony really started to we, we sort of decided well we're going to push ahead with it anyway. And then Sony started to make the noises part of the way through our porting cycle and we, we let out the collective sigh of, yay, it was so good to have that support from Sony to say that, yes, PSVR is an ongoing thing, that there's going to be PSVR 2, that the, the PlayStation 5 is is going to um, be a be a really good home for, for VR and, and, and pretty exciting some of the specs for that next-gen headset. It's looking really exciting, so... Um, yeah, we were really keen to sort of see how the how the game went on uh, on PSVR. What's the most effective way have you guys seen or feel that has been you know to get as many people to try your app? SideQuest demo to App Lab. Yes, we have we have a demo. First, it was on SideQuest, then App Lab was uh, was launched, and then we we br brought the demo to to App Lab. So this is. Uh, an effective way for people to discover the game before they willing to buy it. And we are in a quite, I would say, unique position uh, because there are some certain types of games on Quest that are still, or in VR in general, that are like still quite new. So you, you, you have, you know, like one or two boxing games. Um, you have some, you know, like you have one or two table tennis games. And in our case, uh, the rhythm scene, uh, you have the biggest VR game ever made there. So top one game, uh, Beat Saber. Uh, so usually you can, it's safe to assume that, you know, like eight to nine, seven, eight or nine out of 10 people who, who, who go to the store to discover new games, like they already own and play Beat Saber. So for them, it, it, it's we, we have to prepare an answer to the question, why should I be interested in your game? Why should I buy it if I already own something that looks so similar on the trailers? Or the concept seems similar. Uh, so yeah, this is the challenge that, that we have with, with synth riders. Um, so um, it's pretty much, much about the language you use. Um, and uh, that we try to emphasize certain aspects of the game that make it the most, make it unique and make it feel and play differently. Um, do you target mostly people who are already in VR or do you also try to target people who don't have a headset, uh, but to, to lure them to buy your app and the headset with it, basically? We are very, it's very deliberate on our end to, try to focus on, on people who already own VR because we are, as we used to say, we are not in the headset market, we are in the game market. So uh, that, you know, like spending money on you know, like ads or spending time and energy on getting featured, you know, like somewhere where, you know, in front of the audience that is not VR ready, it's just, uh, um, I think it's a noble thing to do to, you know, like evangelize VR, uh, but uh, the, the platforms that are there are very good at doing it, especially I would say right now, um, yeah, of course, PlayStation, Sony, and, and of course, Facebook, Oculus, mm -hmm. they, they, they do tremendous work uh, spreading word about VR and getting more people to, to buy headsets. So uh, we try to avoid, um, places or, or you know, like marketing uh, investments where it's, it would not be in front of people who own headsets. But in our right. case, we have another question, like, are we targeting people who, who are, for example, core Beat Saber fans or people who own Beat Saber but are just, it's just one of the games for them or people who are so new to VR that they, have not, they haven't bought Beat Saber yet so we can be the first VR rhythm game day. Sure. So there's also this uh, this kind of conversation. That's, that's going on. Yes, Will, you want to say? Yes, yeah, so probably the, the one thing, the one group of people that we do talk to who may not have mm -hmm. headsets, and it is something that we do that some other games don't do, is that we talk to the arcade market. So Synth Riders is still something that you can play in an arcade, and um, that's that we do have quite a few arcades that, that pick it up through Springboard, and, um, and, and we do pushed into that area a little bit. And that's probably the people who may be ready for VR but want to try it before they buy it. So 
having a presence in arcades can be something that can be helpful um, in in that regard. It's it's not gonna it's not gonna change the world in terms of the numbers, mm-hmm. but it is it is a way that people can have an experience with your game that when they do come to, to pick up VR, they go, "Yep, I played that. It was fun." Mm-hmm. And that comes back into the make it easy, make it fun from the very first moment that people pick up and put a headset on, and. And that does feed into the OST, like the way that we do our, our difficulty grading. It's something that we, we make a very, very big deal about with our team is that we have an easy difficulty mm-hmm. in our game. And the easy difficulty is designed for first-time gamers. Not first-time VR, but first-time gamers. So people who've never put on a headset before, people who may never have played a rhythm game before, people who may never have played a game before. They need to be able to put that headset on and be able to have fun. Uh, and so easy difficulty is exactly what it says on the tin. And you do get a few people who say, oh, well, you know, easy is too easy. It's like, well, no, there's no such thing as too easy. It's designed for the people who, when they see a wall coming towards them for the first time, actually duck and cower on the floor because they don't know what to do. <laughs> Why is a wall yeah. moving towards me? You know, so, yeah, it's it's an interesting group of people to to talk to, the arcade and the first time uh, first time players who may play it with a friend or play it in an arcade, yeah. And the, the enterprise people as well, and the gyms. Are you guys in? Do you guys work with gyms, or do do you work in other backdoor ways as well? You mainly, uh, you know, just advertise and and. I mean, do you, actually, yes. Yeah, so that would be my first question. Do you guys work with enterprises as well, and gyms and other people like that as well? Not at this point in time. Not yet. Do you feel there's a need to? Uh, so in our case, there's a, a clear like fitness potential inside the game, but it's still pretty much by accident. It's not, uh, it's not a fitness app uh, yet, but uh, I'm sure when you get to the point where you have enough features or modes inside the game to make it uh, 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 you know, like viable fitness tool, then it, it definitely does make sense to, to, to talk to, to this. To those other people. From this, yeah. One of the questions I think uh, would be quite good to have an answer to is, uh, it's great that you guys have the experience of working with PCVR, which I guess with Steam and... Uh, HTC, and Sorry, Viveport. 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 Yeah, Viveport. Yeah. Uh, and also PSVR and then Facebook, um, all the other way around. Now, how much influence do distributor pla- distribution platforms have over the direction of the content that goes in your game and the direction of the game itself, if any? There are specific examples. For example, um, let's look at Oculus Challenges and Oculus Avatars. So there are those are two examples where um, the, the platform said, hey, we're going to do these features. Would you like to be have early access to them? Would you like to implement them? And in both cases, we went, yeah, why not? Let's do that. So um, when we did uh, Oculus Challenges, we also... We also, whenever we have these opportunities that come up from platform, we do try and find ways that we can continue to make those cross cross platform features. And so, when Oculus Challenges came up, we also implemented that uh, functionality for every player on our game, not just for, for Oculus. So there was a certain amount of exclusivity, and it behaves slightly differently on the Oculus platform. There's a deeper level of integration, but um, that that became something that we were able to make available to every player because. The, the functionality within the Oculus platform didn't quite go far enough for what we wanted to be able to do with, um, with that concept. So we wanted to build upon that. So um, they, they can have an influence in that they can come and say, hey, we've, we've got some new features. If you, if you want to implement them, you can we'll give you a bit, of, um, a bit of promotion as part of the, the group of people who are launching early with those. And there's a certain amount of prestige to being an early access and an early launcher with some features. But um, in all of those situations, you can always turn around and say, no, thank you. So it's always a mutually beneficial thing. It's never a, it's never a dictatorial thing. Um, you know, when we look at something like some platforms like PlayStation is a great example where we have, we have actually had to launch without some, some features, but that's purely because we're not ready to meet the requirements. The requirements for that platform are, are different. And so we're just not able to to launch with that, but it just means we've got different hurdles we need to jump over for that particular platform compared to, say, Oculus or, um, or Steam or Viveport. Um, yeah, it's just a little bit different. 
And what was it like to work with uh, Pico? They're relatively new in the in the market. Uh, they're uh, just launched at Neo3 not too long ago in China. Obviously, they're trying to focus more on the China market, which I guess uh, would be something very attractive to to you guys, and not just China, of course, uh, more more Asia. What was it like to work with them compared to the big guns like HTC, Sony, you know, Facebook? Uh, what are some of the things you feel are lacking there that uh, perhaps uh, would be more helpful, and and vice versa? You know, that you find they're bringing you uh, in that value compared to the others? They were really great to, to work with. And it, it's clear that because it's very serious about uh, VR and, and currently six DOF um, VR. So, you know, like that, the one with, we did not do the port ourselves. It was a, there was a separate company that did the porting. Uh, but we know that people enjoy the game on this platform and actually their attention is, is, is quite impressive. So it's, a, uh, it's clear that people enjoy uh, synth riders and on, on, on this headset. Uh, one thing that it's, it's quite challenging is that uh, it, everything is Chinese. It's in Chinese, you know, like the, the, the press coverage, the, the, the videos that people make, um, so it's, um, the, the internet is, is, is quite different in China. So for me, like I used to be, I'm used to be like quite hands-on, uh, and, uh, when it comes to PR, uh, advertising, uh, this kind of stuff. And with Pico, it's just totally, it's, it's out of my our control. It's like going on Mars. <laughs> yes, yes. And it's actually, I feel like it's someone else going on Mars with, with our game. It's not, I don't feel like, I, I even find it difficult, find it difficult to think about the thing. It, I, don't, I don't feel like it was me or us to launch the game there. Like, uh, and not only because of the development process, the porting process, but also the thing that you can just, you know, like through this gray Chinese wall, uh, have a certain glimpse of like what's going on. We, uh, but it's pretty, yeah, it's pretty hands off. So that's my experience. Yeah, and definitely um, from a from a community point of view, it is it's kind of challenging to know that there is a, a community out there that I can't get into as as easily as I would like to. Um, I'm do you guys do you have WeChat? I do actually have WeChat. I've actually been to China a number of times, and I speak just uh, I speak Idianar, Idianar, <laughs> a little Mandarin, <laughs> like so, a true Beijinger. <laughs> absolutely, yep. Um, that's I don't sound enough like a pirate. Like, I'm not doing my R enough, but um, <laughs> I, I know enough to get into trouble. So <laughs> it's I, I do have a bit of an idea of where to start looking and where to go and find the information, but. Um, you know, my, my ideal would actually be to, to partner with somebody in China. And I think, I think that would be um, even better, you know, maybe, maybe if we ever get through, through into post COVID times, it would be really nice to actually be able to go, um, go back to China again and, um, and actually make contact and, and meet, meet these people like meet Pico, but also to meet part of the community too, because there is definitely a group of people who are filming the game in mixed reality. There's people with track cameras, there's people who are playing on Pico. There's people who are playing on, on uh, SteamVR. There are arcades like Surreal in Beijing, which is incredible. I love that arcade. That was a fantastic place to visit. And uh, it would be good to be able to get on the ground and, and, and make some more contact now that the game is a little more, more widely known uh, over there. So, yeah. is, it, is it multiplayer over there in China? No. Not at this point in time. Um, there is the possibility of that happening. And then again, it's one of those things that you sort of look at and go, uh, if the, if the game does, does well, then, um, we can, we can look at, you know, using servers on the ground in, in China to do that. And the same with, um, with the, 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 cut, the leaderboard, because we run our own leaderboard system. So again, there's a possibility of running our own leaderboards in China, should we want to go down that path. So, it's been, been kind of nice. We can have these sort of stage things. And that's probably the other thing I'd say is when you're looking at a new market, you know, having the ability to stage these things and roll them up based on response 
is probably a very good way to, to go about things. So once you know that the game has got a foothold and is getting established and got some, some good retention of players, then you can actually um, bring these features out over there. You can have the multiplayer launch uh, the same way that we did with uh, with our players on you know, PSVR and, and uh, PCVR and the way we're going to do with PSVR in the future too. So how do you guys manage to get all the translators, get all the people with the boots on the ground over there? Were Pico able to to help you provide you that support? Uh, or did you have to go and find them on your own? What, what was the process like? Because I think a lot of people are very curious about working with Pico, but they don't really have a clue as to what goes on as to how to put things together in, in China. And like you said, it's, it's a completely different world. Uh, they do the translation services as well. So the, the porting, um, the, the people who did the port um, actually did the translation services and the way that the way that we designed the game is actually very translatable as part of the development process. Most of the text objects, I'd say probably 90% of the text objects in the game mm-hmm. are actually external and they, they live in a file and it's very, very straightforward to do the translation process. So you don't have to um, rebuild the game every time you, you want to port it to a new language. You just need to translate those those across. The hardest thing was to find a, a suitable font that would uh, that would, would right. work with, uh, with with characters um, that would sit within the space. So I think so. What, what kind of, what kind of support Pico uh, provide, especially when it comes to marketing a game over there that you feels has helped you? Can, can you share some of the the benefits, some of the add value that you guys have had? There was the big launch. They did that really, really large launch, which was quite quite amazing when they did the launch of the Neo 3. And certainly being able to be part of that with um, with with the, the group of games, there was, we're part of a launch bundle as well. That's right, isn't it, Paul? We're part of a, a launch bundle. And you could talk about that. Yes, correct. So so we had a... That was a good launch, be, yeah. uh, 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 One of the games. Not only we were... We had a huge booth on that, on that you know, like, physical event there, but also, uh, we were one of the titles that were on the box, so you can get this. Of course, it happens once when the when the new headset gets released. Uh, and also, we were in a bundle, so you could buy uh, like a special edition of a headset, and that included several games, including and also some riders. Um, other than that, what they do offer, I think, because they get they get invested in the thing, so they help with porting translation. Uh, they put the game on the box. They also then make sure that you get store visibility. And from our experience, um, this is um, this is a key. So, for example, something we learned on on, on Quest Store is that you can have a, a huge event that you do on your end. You know, like a synchronized, coordinated, you know, like advertising with with uh, an update release with with press coverage with some YouTubers, uh, some creators, influencers, and to combine all of it together. But if you do not get uh, an increased uh, impression, so increased visibility on the store, it's the bump in sales is going to be uh, minimal. It's it's more like for a long term uh, it brings long, longer term benefits when people have to see the game you know, like X amount of times before they actually make the decision to buy. So then uh, a YouTube video or an ad, it's just one of the steps uh, that gets people closer to buying the game, you know, like next time it is on sale. And with visibility on the store, if the game gets featured, that's instant uh instant results, like instant profit that, that, that you get. Do the distribution so, channels, cha- uh, can you buy this from the various different distribution channels or generally it's not something that they sell at the moment? I've, I'm, I'm, I believe that PlayStation is the only one that allows you to, to promote within the store. So you cannot pay, at least Valve is not, you cannot just go to Valve and say like, hey, we would like to buy some, you know, like real estate on the store. Uh, you can pitch something, uh, but it's a different process. With Quest, uh, you can go to them when you have a big update coming and you can discuss being featured in the new and updated section and also some hero featuring. Um, uh, with PlayStation, there is a, a promoted like a section on the store. So you can actually go and buy some visibility, but I heard it's like pretty expensive. 
it's not something that's that's easily um, achievable by you know, like VR, VR, uh, VR exclusive titles. I think. Uh, and with Pico, they it's it's all up to them. It's uh, uh, it's their store, uh, of course, and they it's their best interest to to promote games that are uh, that are great. And also, in our case, the competition is 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 uh, reduced with uh, Beat Saber not being there. <laughs> so we are, I would say, top one or top two uh, VR rhythm game on on Pico. Um, pick a platform right now. Do you find that? Do you find that in Asia, uh, you guys are getting a lot of people trying your app compared to the US or or Europe? Because in Singapore, I don't think there's many of us with a VR headset here. But Singapore is a relatively small small place. Uh, BP Gretzky, your feedback on this? Uh, yes. Yeah, so uh, w what we can see is that that the most uh, active um, country in Asia is uh, Korea. South Korea, of course, um, and we get uh, a significant number of players playing there. Um, and then with Pico, we see that there's a, also a significant num number of people who play on their platform. So it seems that was it was quite a successful launch. Um, and I guess we, it's safe to say that we recommend uh, to other developers to, to go and talk to Pico uh, and port the game over. Yep, definitely. Where does the idea start from? Do you guys like all fling ideas to each other, pull out of a hat? Um, and then once you decide on that idea, how does it start? How does the magic start to, to come alive? What's yeah, the production say, process? Yeah, it's a production process. We, it is very similar for, for things that we've done in the past to the way things work in the future. So, so quite often within the team, it's, you know, the creative director, um, or other, other people in the team who go, you know what would be really cool? We should do this. Um, you know, in, in Aben's case, you know what would be really cool? We could have notes that go overhead while you play and you're turning around in the space. And the, the 360 plus spin mode arrived very fully featured in his head uh, instantly. And then, so what happens is we have these little, little meetings, we get together and, and, and he goes, wouldn't it be amazing if we can do this? And then the devs, go off and go, yep, this will be fun. Let's do that. So we often do these, these sort of small prototypes and we prototype the idea. And then uh, the prototyped idea then often comes, comes to me. I'm, I'm the guinea pig that gets shoved into the, into the, the windmill and uh, when it came to spin mode. So we, we had this, this concept of these notes going around and around and then I played that and iterated that worked out what did and didn't work, followed the fun because that's, um, that's what we do. Um, and that's how spin mode was, was born. You know, we, we, we went into this environment, part of my testing rig, I have, I have a mixed reality set up so they can get to see me being tortured. So they don't just get to, to look at how the game behaves, but they can also watch me actually playing it, um, in, in the space as well, which is really quite helpful. Mm -hmm. And and we just work through all the problems as we go. So I'm I'm pretty fearless. So they'll just shove me in there, and and I'll just play my hardest, and and I'll say this is fun, or that that's not fun, or this is this is I can't see what I need to do next, or the notes just vanish behind me. I have no idea where I needed to be. And then we just we just problem solve our way through it. We do this sort of creative problem solving process. And I have to say, it's actually incredibly fun. This is that's. I, I, I said to, to my boss the day, I said, I have the best job in the universe. And, and it is, it's true when you, when you're doing this, this creative process, um, this is the fun side of, of, of what we do, um, developing new ideas and collaboratively shaping them as a, as a group, um, following the fun, um, and then play testing it, uh, until the fun is really refined and, and you have, you know, and, and, we, we tend to look for what is the, the regular fun and then the what is the insane fun, the, 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 the really crazy. And so that's why our spin mode has styled. Has, has styled in the middle, it has mild at one end and it has wild at the other end. And the idea is that we, we pitch styled for where most people are going to want to have just a tiny little bit of terror, just a little pinch. And then wild is for, for the, the crazy people who want to go hard. And then mild is for people who really just like to be a little bit more sedate in what they do. Now, Sense Riders is obviously, uh, uh, I mean, it, it's class more of a VR fitness app uh, than 
an arcadey experience, let's say, or, or a wild ride in, in a fruit of colors. Um, well, was that the direction you guys were, were going for? And also on the projects you're working on, uh, I understand you can't reveal much, but is, is Cluj looking to stay within this genre or are you looking to to go somewhere else? Because the guys who do O-Shape down chess club, that's completely different. Uh, so I'm just curious to, to know a little bit more about that. I would say uh, the development team have been working on Synth Riders uh, since, what, 2017, 2016? That's five years. Um, that's a long time. So I don't think they'll be putting their hand up to do another rhythm game um, immediately. Um, Synth Riders is in the, is in the support and, and feature part of its life cycle. So we're, we're just um, iterating through experiences of where we're finding a lot of fun at the moment. These are really good for our creative team. They're, they're incredibly good to, to work on. Um, everyone gets to have these beautiful reactions to music and then we get to share those reactions with, with players. Uh, so we're, we're at that, that phase where we're, we're sort of doing feature introduction and, and, and mechanic changes, but it's subtle. It's subtle. It's at that subtle stage. It's not in the, the, um, it's in the refinement rather than the, the, the redefinition. So I think it's safe to say that, that we're not looking to do another rhythm game in a hurry. Um, what were some of the things that you've learned from Synth Riders that you've been able to port uh, or, you know, do differently? As you mentioned earlier, there are some things you wish you could have done differently uh, into the new stuff that you guys are working on. Oh, well, the first thing from a, from a product management point of view and, uh, and, and a facilitation of, of rapid iteration, um, all of the, every new project we do is actually been rolled under Plastic SCM now for the source control side of things. So um, it's eventually we will probably go back to synth riders and pull it under under scm as well um but getting some experience with you know having having started from a, a project that that grew grew like topsy um which is as it has done because it was started off with one developer and then there's two and then there's three and, and more, more fingers and more changes over time um having it under a really good branching uh version control system particularly once you start to introduce things like porting is is really really important and you know in my role as a as a as a pm you know i i really want to be able to do push button change log when it comes to uh, doing qa and testing you know i need to have my my test scripts be generated um from a from a system once you start to get a a, a piece of software that's five years into its software development life cycle having a tool that will will tell you these are the things that have been touched when they're you know they're no longer two people working on it there's now 20 people in the in the team that could possibly touch it at, at any one time so yeah having having an automated tool like that so that's the biggest thing for us is is you know every new project goes under um under plastic scm now and especially with with unity having bought plastic it just becomes so much uh, so much easier and plastic allows you to do um the almost the almost infinite branching which is really good for a studio like us that likes to do this um, this rapid prototyping uh, and run you know ten different versions of of the game for every developer who's working on their one little passion project um, that's sitting on the side of the of the thing. So that's that's my my big takeaway. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, there's definitely some stuff we could do better. Uh, um. I just, I, I have this feeling that there's a couple of things I could bring, but just nothing comes to my mind like right now. Um, but I think what worked well was to start with early access on Steam, especially for VR. It's still relevant uh, how, how different it is uh, compared to flat, flat gaming. And that uh, something that feels great for one person or even a team, maybe just unplayable or like uncomfortable or not that interesting for, for other people uh, because of how VR is being experienced rather than just you know, like play it on a flat screen in front of you. Mm -hmm. So this is something I think it's, uh, we may want to repeat this pattern with our upcoming projects. So uh, either Steam Early Access or App Lab um, open data or definitely this, this, this is something that worked very well for us and we want to continue doing it. Okay. Let me just um, pause here very quickly. Sorry to cut you. So it's just, 
Yeah, so, yeah, there's definitely some stuff we could do better. Uh, um, I just, I, I have this feeling that there's a couple of things I could bring, but just nothing comes to my mind, like, right now. Um, but I think what worked well was to start with early access on Steam, especially for VR. It's still relevant uh, how how different it is uh, compared to flat flat gaming and that uh, something that feels great for one person or even a team, maybe just unplayable or like uncomfortable or not that interesting for, for other people uh, because of how VR is being experienced rather than just you know, play it on a flat screen in front of you. Mm -hmm. So this is something I think it's, uh, we may want to repeat this pattern with our upcoming projects. So uh, either Steam Early Access or App Lab, um, Open Data, or definitely this, this, this is something that worked very well for us and we want to continue doing it. Um, for example, are you guys going to develop uh, eSport competitions more and all these kind of things? Well, I mean, we've, we've had a little experience with that with Synth Riders. We had our first world championship at the Val Summer Games, and we're doing Val Summer Games again this year. Um, cool. Which is, it is very interesting to, to see, and it'd be interesting to see 12 months along how the competitive community has changed because, of course, this time the, the Quest players are incredibly competitive, and we've introduced a category for, for PSVR. To, to join in the fun, even though they've only just had the had the game for a very short period of time, um, we're running a second category for them. So it is it is interesting to to do that. Um, yeah, just to sort of to sort of see how the how the the you know with with synth writers as, as an IP, it is very social and it is very social and fun and and friendly on the on the surface, but there is this depth there. There is a quite a dedicated competitive community, and um, how you balance those two two sides of, of 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 the game is really really interesting. And I'm hoping that that's going to hold us in good stead. If down the track the titles that that we're looking at, you know, if any of those do go down the path of um, being suitable for esports, um, having had a little bit of a taste of what what competitive um, play is like and the sorts of demands that competitive players have to make a, to make a sport serious. Uh, it's very, very different, <laughs> very, very different. And you, you sort of have to know that going in. And I think it's very important to have somebody running a, a, a project like that who, who really has a great understanding of what it means to, to, to be a competitive player and, and, and what drives a competitive player. Um, right. Yeah. And and uh, have you guys thought about what do you guys think about the idea of, uh, for example, you know, having some power ups that come towards you uh, in the shape of or having the name Red Bull on it, or all these kind of things? Uh, are these a way to monetize uh, in an additional way in synth riders? Have you guys had this talk internally? Uh, what are your thoughts about this, both from a marketing and then from a creative direction point of view, which I guess could clash sometimes? Uh, but it'd be great to to have your 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 thoughts on this. How are you first? <laughs> yeah, so uh, we like we also what happened when some of the games uh, try to implement ads um, on on Oculus platform. Even before it happened, there was a huge backlash. Um, so um, so yeah, ads in VR games is something we'd rather. Try to avoid. As Sorry as to interrupt possible. you, do, but don't you find that the backlash that occurred is really because uh, Oculus was trying to come up with some kind of algorithm or do some kind of testing or something with that specific uh, developer, as opposed to you know if you if you play a set of Competizione or all the Sims, I mean there are ads there, no one's really bothered about it because they're not associated to Facebook in this case. They're doing their own thing. They've done it for a while and they do it in a in a very subtle way yeah. right so i was actually first when it first uh the when this you know like crisis happened i was the the first to um kind of uh, defend 
the idea of us in VR, because I was like, if it's one of the perspective perspectives you can look at it is that this is just another uh, way for developers to monetize their games. And if it's between someone not being able to make a game and make it, you know, like financially, uh, because of the financial reasons, uh, because they they are not able to find funds for the game, versus having more games, uh, for example, some more like arcade games that are like free to play, but still you can the developers can, you know, like monetize them or like because of ads, then why not? Like why not? have this one more option. No one, it's not like people are forced to use it. And I was always saying in this particular example, you shouldn't introduce ads to a game that's already out. If, if someone paid for a premium, you know, like title without ads, you, you probably shouldn't introduce them like some at, at one point in time. Uh, unless you, for example, launch a free to play version of the game that is with ads, and but only this version of the game has ads. So I was just like, why not let people monetize their games in this one more way? We know that VR is small. Many developers struggle to to to, to make games or like keep making games one after another because they do not get earn enough money making it, making the games and selling them. Uh, but then uh, I read some comments from from other people and and learned some some different aspects of it that I wasn't like thinking about at that point. For example, the thing that in VR, you cannot basically, this is a, a, a screen that's like strapped to your head. So you cannot just turn it off. When you watch TV, you just skip channels when the advertising block begins. When you're on your phone, you just turn off the screen or like you swap between apps if you don't want to see Ads. And in VR, if, if it's somewhere there inside the game, then there, I have no other way, unless I want to get out of VR, there's no other way to turn to, to stop seeing it. Uh, so this is one aspect of it. The second one is that people, VR is, uh, when VR, of course there are ads outside of VR in real life, but there is a reason why we escape into VR. And one of them may be the fact that we want to escape from this uh, overload of information and you know, like sponsored content, advertising, uh, influencer marketing, or or how some some cities are polluted with with banners, for example. So in VR, we have this chance to create we create new reality from scratch, and we are the one to decide how it's going to look. Is it going to be the same thing that we have? Are we going to reproduce things that we are not totally fans of in real life? Or is it going to be an utopia, a place that is free from it, that lets you find your balance and um, take some rest from, from how the outside world is? And that's the first thing someone said to me is to ask, actually to ask the developers, is that they got a little bit annoyed with the fact that there are actually ads, like advertising banners inside Synth Riders. They are fake ads. These are uh, mostly names of different developers and members of the team, people involved with the game. This is a, there's an environment that is a city. Uh, you're standing on a rooftop, so you see this modern city with a lot of, you know, like neons. This is how the city City kind of city looks like so. This is uh, there's a, a a very good reason for having them there. But still, some people told us that it is a little bit annoying to have ads there, even if they are fake ads. So, yeah, this is why I think unless we 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 are somehow forced to do it, or we launch a title that's um, that that that's monetized around ads, we we are rather going to avoid it. Uh, Will, what are your thoughts on this? Have you guys had this chat in, uh, in throughout the production process? And uh, yeah, well, you... yeah, I, I have a billboard in Spin City, so I'm I'm guilty of advertising in VR, my coffee shop. Um, <laughs> 
Oh, it was interesting because when that situation happened again, the, the community, various people came and said, so are you going to put ads in Synthroiders? The community actually are pretty good and they know they can pretty much ask, ask anything of us and, and, and my policy with, um, with community is I will be absolutely as honest as I possibly can be and as open as I possibly can be. And my answer to the community is really simple. Say, well, we have a DLC funding model. That is our funding model. So the, the safest way for our players to make sure there are no ads in the game is to continue supporting the game by buying DLC. Um, if, they, if they're if they buying our song packs, if our song packs uh, are, are good quality and, and the players continue to support us through that, well, we can fund our active game development through that process. So. I mean, if, if Red Bull came to you guys and said, look, we'll give you a million dollars to call your next DLC the, the Red Bull DLC, right? Uh, and they might have songs under their own licenses or what have you not. Um, you know, would that be acceptable? Yeah, oh, I don't think it'd be acceptable in the context, but, you know, <laughs> it, so context is everything in this situation. It really is everything in that situation. Um, I don't think it would make sense. Like, I don't think Red Bull would, would ever do that. Like, Red Bull wouldn't hand us a million It's just bucks. an example. I know. Who knows? Who knows what could they, they could do that? <laughs> well, it, it is the, you know, being a, being a music rhythm game, you know, you think about, about music and advertising and product placements, you know, you come back to things like Michael Jackson and Pepsi and, and you know, the, these, these brands do align themselves with musicians. Now, the, the question I would have is if, if a brand, if a musician whose music we wanted, in the game. And technically, you know, you can actually say that the experiences that we do and the licensing of musicians we put in our game is advertising those musicians in our game to a point. Yes, particularly, of course. particularly for smaller musicians and independent artists mm -hmm. who, um, like, take, for example, the Synthwave, Synthwave 2 pack. Well, in that particular pack, we have Muse who are, you know, massive. They're like in the top, top 100 selling artists in the US. They're, they're doubling some of their songs, double, triple platinum songs. In that same pack as them, we're putting people who uh, are on the, the Fix-It label who wouldn't have anywhere near as wide a reach had they not had their music put alongside of Muse in that particular pack. So in some ways, we are, are, we are advertising those artists to a point. But in the context of the game, that makes sense. That's part yes. of what we do is we, we say... Right. We want to encourage people to explore new music. We find musicians that, that we like, we find music that we like, and we have relationships with labels and we bring the music into the game. And, that's good. That's also because they're yeah. people. I mean, a band to mm. most people is a person. Like, yeah, and not a brand, right? exactly. But, right. you know, large, large musicians like a, like a Muse and like an Offspring, they are a brand. And we are using their branding inside of the experiences. The offspring one, for yes, example, of is the skull, of which course. is using their, their logo uh, of, of the skull through that. Uh, the, the Muse algorithm experience using imagery, which was part of their simulation theory tour and part of the, the material that they did to support their album simulation theory. So um, by using their newer songs, you know, we helped to get, get word out that they, they have Uh, new music that they have, have new stuff and would be reaching an audience that they wouldn't normally reach as well and what's interesting you know there is actually a history of um of record labels using rhythm games to promote new music and there's actually uh, speaking with the australian experience warner mm -hmm. australia have actually done this on at least two in, two instances that i'm aware of and one of them was in synth riders they took um uh was was it I want to say Weezer. Weezer had a new new song that came out and they had an influencer in Australia who uh, uh, got a song mapped, mm -hmm. got that song mapped and they promoted it on their on their Twitch and their YouTube channel playing that song in Synthritis. And the right. same influencer has done the same thing for Warner with a song in Beat Saber. So um, there, just be aware this stuff does happen. <laughs> it is happening to a degree. It's all within context. And I suspect that... that You know, when it comes to the idea of, of Facebook platform marketing, it's very different to that kind of, hey, there's a, there's a new song coming out. We want to get it in front of people who, who like music. You, may, you like this game. You like this influencer. You may be interested in this particular song because that person mm -hmm. enjoys that song. It's different to um, me having a Facebook profile that says that I like squirrels and me playing synth riders and all of a sudden being shown images of images of squirrel feeders and and squirrel this and squirrel that you know in the squirrel socks i might like to buy some squirrel socks while i'm playing synth riders that's what i mean by context is everything so and i think that's probably the biggest objection that people people have to to platform driven advertising as opposed to more context sensitive advertising 
Um, okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, did you want to add anything to this, Paul? Yeah. So basically, you just don't want to be chased down with ads into your VR experience as yeah. a player. You don't so, want the Futurama experience of being chased down the street with billboards. <laughs> no one wants that. Yeah, con context awesome. is a uh, I'd love to understand a little bit more about your process, about your pricing strategy between when you first started uh, to now. Uh, so why you guys took the direction to, to price the way that you are? What, what kind of things do you do? Do you do focus groups, surveys? Do you, how, how do you find the right price? Uh, and, and how do you decide on going with that specific strategy? Yeah, so let me actually open uh, SteamDB to remind myself what, how, we, how, we, uh, how the price of the game changed. Okay, let me switch to US dollars. Um, one second. So currently the price of the game is $25. That's for, for, for context. And that's across all platforms. So that's on Steam, Quest, and PlayStation VR. And some, tit some titles, they, uh, they have a higher price on PlayStation VR. Probably because of how much time and energy it takes to, to port a game to, to PlayStation uh, platform. Uh, but in our case, we decided to, to stick to the same price. Um, and part of the reason, uh, so, so our pricing strategy is it's, uh, it's in the context of, of, of competition. Um, uh, so we want to make sure that our game is, is affordable and it's just a little bit cheaper than, than the other titles that you could consider buying the game or to make it an easier decision to buy our game after you buy, after you got the, for example, you know, like another popular VR game that's, that's a little bit more expensive. Uh, when we launched the game in Steam Early Access, it was $10. So the price more than doubled since then. Um, and then uh, the price rise to 17, then to 20 bucks, and then to $25. And we always uh, had a, tried to have a very good reason uh, to rise the price. So, for example, I believe the number of songs more than tripled since we first launched the game uh, on Steam Early Access. So the game is just like, it's just much bigger than it used to be. Uh, and we have increased the price two times, adding new mode to the game. So for example, we have introduced a spin mode uh, or a multiplayer. These are serious modes that extend, make that let's spend more time with the game uh, and have fun, like, you know, like get more out of the game and may have more diverse experience with it. And also the number of songs uh, grows. Um, so this is why we, these were our reasons to, to, to increase the pricing, but always making sure that we are just a little bit less expensive than, than, than the competition. Right. <clears throat> so you look at all the different various costs, basically, from the licensing and the music to the uh, operational costs and market distribution costs. I mean, uh, all these platforms, do they more or less charge you the same? I mean, we know Facebook is, what, 30%? Steam's, what, 30%? Uh, yeah. PSVR, I'm not quite sure. Pico, I haven't asked them yet. Uh, does it take a big chunk from the revenue, all these, all these kind of platforms? Yeah, it's 30% across all of the platforms, I believe. Um, and with the base game, it's quite straightforward. So we have to, you have 30%, then you have another, uh, five to 10% that goes for, you know, like taxes and other stuff. Right. And then, then what remains is yours, uh, with music licensing. So with, um, with DLCs, it's, it's a little bit more complicated because we have certain, you know, like agreements, licensing agreements with the artists. And we have to share revenue with them after we shared it with the platform holders. So um, it's, it's more tricky to, 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 to make money there. But there are, there are many different benefits of, having, of adding more music to the game uh, other than just the pure 
um, amount to get from from each uh, song being sold. Do you think 30% of the profit being taken by the distribution channels is fair or do you think it's something, it's actually pretty high? I think it's high um, because the business scales for the platform holders, but not for us. So for them having one more game, you know, like having millions of titles or like hundreds of thousands of titles on Steam, having one more title, it's not a big deal. And usually these platforms are quite hands-off. So they, unless you are already an established popular title uh, or a developer with a history of popular games, they are not going to offer you much support when it comes to visibility on the store. Uh, it's quite limited what you can expect. The bigger the platform, the less you can expect, basically. And still, they charge you 30%. Uh, so I'm, I don't want to say like we are not grateful, and um, we have a great relationship with, with each of these platforms, and they are helping us. But I know that we are in a quite um, you know, like good position compared to some other developers. So I know that if it was a smaller title, it would still still be 30% and we wouldn't get X or Y kind of support we, we got. Uh, so for them, that would be even more difficult because uh, you launch a game without much of a, of a, of a, of a visibility uh, or promotion from the platform holder and still one third of it is gone. Of the, of the and also when you do promotions, like, uh, you know, Steam often have their own promotions. I mean, they all do. Uh, and, you know, Christmas sales coming up, 10% off this and that. Uh, does that add another 10%? So it would be effectively be 40% lost? Or is this something no. that they absorb? Oh, no, it's, it's always on you. Oh, so, right, right. Yeah. Uh, th there are certain, like, there are sometimes, I know that Epic Games, what they do is sometimes they have this extra, for example, they give away $10 to all, to all people on, on, on Epic Games Store mm -hmm. that people can spend on games, uh, on discounted games during you know, like seasonal sales. So, of course, this right. $10 is coming from Epic. That, that's their expense. But with other platforms, if you lower the, you know, if you go minus fifty percent, then it goes from twenty bucks to ten bucks, and then they take thirty percent of. But they, it, it's of ten bucks, not of twenty, of course. So that's a good thing. It's, so uh, when you when you look at uh, other apps uh, like Supernatural, who charge a subscription, is that something that you guys have looked at? What What are your thoughts about that kind of pricing strategy? If any, um, we do sometimes get get requested for like a season pass type thing, and, and Audica is probably the closest the closest to to that. With where Audica has like a season pass you can buy every year, which gets you all the songs that are released in that year. And our complete collection DLC bundle is probably the closest thing to that that we would be considering doing, um, which is where you get a permanent discount essentially for continually topping up your DLC. Which, <laughs> which hit the limit on the Oculus store. Unfortunately, we have too many items. You have to. We may wind up having to go to a season pass. <laughs> we might have to do it uh, to to continue to extend that. So that's probably the closest thing to us. I want to call that the closest thing to a subscription model that that we're prepared to do, which is essentially rewarding people who continually support the DLC by essentially allowing them to continually top up their DLC and pick up the next bundle at a at, a, at an ongoing discount. Um, and that's a really nice thing to be able to do to make it very easy for people to, to keep all the songs in their game. Um, as for, you know, a, a, a supernatural subscription model, we watched, watched FedExR do the transition from a paid game to a subscription model and watched the backlash from that. And there's certainly, when that happened, in their particular instance, a lot of people came and said, the reason we are now switching to playing synth riders all the time is because you don't have a subscription model and we really love that. So there, there definitely is a group of people who, who want to buy the game and who are quite happy to buy the DLC, but they, they already have enough subscription services in their life like Netflix and, and all these other subscription services. They don't want another subscription model. So again, as long as the game's continued development can be funded through, through what we're doing in our current model, 
then there's no need for us to do anything else. And, and we would want to avoid doing that as much as possible. Because, again, it feels like kind of like you're changing the relationship if you, if you, if you do that mid, mid-game and FedExR have done that and it's, it's a very difficult thing to do. And, um, you know, we sort of saw the fallout from that, the way that their players reacted. They, they had that risk of, of some of the player base being completely alienated by that change. Um, which is which is what happened. There was the, the negatives, but they pretty much the way FedEx are have handled it, it's pretty much to go. Well, that, that was then. This is now. Let's pick up and move, <laughs> let's move forward, and and, uh, and that's that's what they've done. So it works for what they want to do. Um, their justification for doing it is because of the way they handle their content. Yeah, which is which is very different to the way that we handle our content. Yeah, uh, I can't I can't necessarily see us doing the same kind of content the way that they do. We're a rhythm game. We're not a not a fitness game at this point in time. But you, but it's an acceptable model in 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 the eyes. I mean, for another potential uh, app, for example. Mm. Well, th- this is the thing: is you got you got the supernaturals of the world and uh, and and FedExR who both those both those um, IP. The proposition is you pay for a gym membership in the real world. This is no different. Ditch the gym and use us instead. And, and gym memberships have been around for a long time and, and having, you know, as a refugee from that particular industry, it's, it's both, it, the industry is founded upon the lie, which is that if every single person who had a gym membership turned up at that gym at the same time, um, there's no way you'd all be able to access everything. <laughs> it's founded right. on you not using your membership. Right. Basically, that is that no matter how, how nice your PT is at the local gym, the, the gym membership is founded on the basis that all the members won't turn up at the door at the same time and, and that a certain percentage of you will not attend this day, this week, this month. That is how, how those models work. It's not a subscription service like a Netflix, I don't think. Mind you, if everybody turned on that had Netflix turned on their Netflix subscription at the same time, <laughs> the yeah. service might grow under the load there. We, which yeah. almost did happen. I think it did happen at some at one stage when uh, when the pandemic first started. Yeah, yeah. Now you guys have uh, have a lot of music. When you first started, you didn't have the big blockbusters that you have today. You mentioned you earlier that you you had you know Muse and all this kind of stuff. Uh, tell us a bit, a little bit more about the process as to uh, what what it takes to go through the licensing, get these big stars. Do you get to meet them? Uh, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, the, the, te- the, te- the technical side, you know, bef- if someone else is trying to, to, to get into doing something like this with these big soundtracks, what is it that they are to expect? We're incredibly lucky, incredibly lucky. So Kluge, Kluge Interactive used to be Kludge Music Magazine in a, in a former life. And our CEO used to run a music magazine and, and had a history, you know, being involved in the music industry very, very closely for a long, a long period of time. And our creative director is a retired DJ, basically. <laughs> so awesome. there's, a, there's a really strong music pedigree. Right. Uh, mm-hmm. inside of Kluge and music really really means a lot to the entire team like we're we're all really passionate about about music and picking music is is something we take incredibly seriously you know we're forever throwing playlists around going hey what about this what about that um, I think having that music industry background in in Arturo has helped immensely it, because it's given him the contacts that that we needed to be able to make the connection. Like, how do you get to talk to these artists? And it's been a step up process. So along the way, we've had to demonstrate our ability to handle um, the the product at the entry level. You know, how do you handle um, smaller indies? Like a lot of the the earth the early pack came from the new retro wave label. Um, and then the, the next pack along would, would, was, you know, Nitrogen Lives and then the Fix It fix it label. So how do you handle these indies? Once you can demonstrate you have the chops to be able to handle those indies and, and promote them and um, make deals with, the, with the, the musicians that are mutually beneficial, that then gives you something in your hand that you can take to the next step, to the next, next biggest artist and say, hey, here's what we did with this artist. Why can't we can do this for you too? And it actually gives you something. So it's kind of like building that portfolio, which you have to build over time. But none of it would have happened if it wasn't for um, ICO's connections that, that he had. 
uh, at that time. And, and Abraham as well, you know, the, the reason that we have Zardonic, who's a very highly respected DJ, um, is because he was a DJ in Venezuela and so was Abraham. So um, Zardonic is, is someone that, that Kluge has had a, a, a long relationship with through, through synth writers and um, yeah, having, having their music in the, in the game has been, been a good thing. Um, yeah, so it's how, just, it's, yeah. How has it helped uh, synth writers? Has it helped to get Muse on board? Did you really see a drastic change? Yes, Powell, you can answer that one. <laughs> That's a Powell question. <laughs> so, so, I mean, how does it help the game? To have yeah, did, did, you, did you see increase in sales, really? Did you see increase in people downloading the app? Did it help? Yeah, yeah, it did. Um, so it definitely helps. Uh, our music um, libraries right now, uh, it's, it's outstanding. And it's, so the game, the base game has more songs than, for example, titles like Rock Band and Guitar Hero launch with. Um, so this is a really generous sele selection. And then you have popular packs and you hear all the time from people who, who decided to buy the game because they knew Muse or The Offspring. Um, so this is a great way to, to get someone's attention and also that legitimize the game. So, uh, you get less comments that you're, you know, like a clone of Beat Saber if the game has Muse, because it's not a, an asset flip that someone did, you know, like in, in two weeks, uh, and just to, you know, um, try to, um, you know, like take some revenue from someone else. It's, it's, um, it's just clear that you have to be an established game with relationship and some, some legit, legit background to be able to bring these kind of titles, this kind of music to the game. Do, do uh, the musicians have any influence on the maps or none? On the maps? Yeah, uh, do they get to have no. a say on, on anything at all or do they uh, give you any feedback or...? Not at this point in time. We haven't actually run into any musicians who are, um, are interested in being involved in that side of things. And, you know, I'm not really sure we'd listen to them. <laughs> When it comes to things like the experiences, yes, the, the, the musician would basically have to be a choreographer. Um, and I don't think any of the musicians that we've had so far would consider themselves to be choreographers because – It's one thing to make music, but it's another thing to um, translate that experience through movement into music. And it's something that our team has a great deal of experience uh, in doing. Our choreography team is, is amazing. And so they, they do a good job. So in indie, indie guys who come to you, uh, how, how do they get rewarded in terms of attribution for, for providing you their songs? Do they get paid a royalty fee? Uh, do you pay a license? I mean, what, what kind of... Uh, you know, admin stuff goes behind the scenes to, to oh, make it's this all kind of deal happen. It's all licensed. Yeah, we pay for the licenses for, for the use of the music inside the game. And um, so the original soundtrack, for example, um, you know, New Retro Wave, that, that, was, that was licensed from the very, very beginning. So every single song in our game is licensed through the label or directly with the artist themselves. So we do have a couple that are, that are direct, artist, um, uh, direct artist signings as well. But yeah, it's all it's all done licensing just as you would do if you wanted to play the music on the radio or on TV or in a movie. Right. All licensed exactly the same way. And it's complicated. <laughs> And how do you guys go about, um, because uh, how, how does the music influence you when you're developing the various different maps? How do you know that the right map goes with the right song? How much experimentation and what kind of things go on there to, to make it a really great experience on each and different map? Oh, the, the map is the map is done in response to the song. All right. So we have a we have a team of mappers who um, they they pick the songs that, that from you know when we have a when we have a new pack coming up, say for example the Electro Swing pack or um, or the Synthwave 2 pack, the, the mappers discuss amongst themselves which songs speak closest to each of them because they all have different musical tastes and musical loves. And they also discuss with each other. They might say, oh, this, this, is, this song has got your name on it. This, this, is, this would suit your style of mapping because they all have different styles of, of mapping and ways that they interpret the music too. Um, it's a very collaborative process. So the whole team does come together and the mappers do work separately, but sometimes they collab. So sometimes they'll have two people working on the one map and they will, will do these little seamless interchanges through. Or sometimes they'll work on different difficulties. 
Um, but usually they'll start on the, the highest difficulty or they'll start on what, the, what they feel like a, a, a difficulty that falls out of the map. And that a part of that is listening to the song, working out what is important in, in the music, you know, the rhythm or the, the, the little nuances that are in the background. What are the, what are the essential parts of that song that a player needs to, um, to feel and, and experience in order to make that connection? And we always say that the best mappers for us are the ones that, that actually come with, with the, no ego into that process. They actually plug the player straight into the music. That is their job. And they just step out the way and make that connection and let the player really feel the music. And, and that's something that's really important in what we do. It's not about the, the, the mapper trying to um, compete with you. It's not about the, the mapper trying to, to, to punish you. The mapper is actually trying to guide you into how you can feel the music in, in what you do. And that's, that's why we say it is, it's a choreography. Um, and it's a few little fun things that happen as we do it. You know, sometimes there might be literal mapping. You know, if the if the song's lyrics talk about a particular concept, then the map may reflect that concept. So sometimes it's lyrics. Sometimes it's instrumentation. There may be really complex instrumentation and the, the, the map will pick up different parts of that instrumentation as you're playing and it will make you aware of things you didn't hear before. There'll be things that you didn't hear and we, we have that when we do our testing all the time is... You know, when I, when I get a map in, in testing and, and I'll play it through and I'll go, actually, there's a sound here that, that you're not mapping that it would be really cool if you picked it up. There's this little diddle diddle dee in the background. And they're like, oh, wow, I didn't actually hear that when I was mapping it. Yeah, that'd be really cool. And so we have this little back and forth that goes between the whole, the whole team um, that we all sort of, our experiences of the songs come together to shape, shape the map. So, yeah, it's all reactive, all very, very reactive. Right. And also, um, you know, you, you guys uh, are in, in the, uh, you know, marketing your app in Asia. So does this mean that you'll start to get more Asian bands or Chinese bands? So if you're marketing South Korea, you get South Korean music, go to China, get Chinese music. Uh, what, what's the strategy there? Or, or do you find that uh, Western music is good enough for now? We have actually had this discussion. Actually, believe it or not, we have had this discussion with our with our music licensing team, and we've got a few people on the ground in in, uh, in, in China and a few people on the ground. In uh, we have a few K-pop specialists that are uh, that are that are around that we're we're, we're sort of talking to. But um, there is definitely Western EDM still goes over incredibly well in in Beijing. You know, when we look at people playing the game on sites like Billy Billy and and when you see the videos, the the songs that people are playing are very much the Western EDM, and they are really are, are quite enjoying them. Um, we, we're just sort of observing a little bit just to see what what sort of, sorts of things are popular, um, and looking at. at what people are, are asking for um the the custom community is really quite um informative in in that way as well but yeah you know, it, it would be would be good to get some there is a there's a huge amount of k-pop overlap that, that would be kind of fun to to get into because the the dance and choreography side of, of k-pop is incredible um but there's certainly a lot of cultural sensitivity that we need to be aware of um when when going into different communities so we're sort of really conscious about making the right choices and, and making musical choices that are, that are right. Uh, and, but really that has to come from a community led thing too. It's not something that, that we want to do on our own. Um, yeah, we, we would want to be consultative about that. Okay. So I've got two questions to ask you. I think you guys will be able to, to answer pretty fast. Uh, first one would be about blockchain. Is blockchain technology something that you guys are looking to integrate as some part in your game? You know, if I play it, I earn coins, uh, which I could then redeem. Is that something you're looking to do? Or are you looking to include NFTs in your, in your strategy? Uh, it'd be great to get your, your feedback on this. No. <laughs> in a word. <laughs> I've been hurt. <laughs> no. No, okay. I haven't, I haven't discussed it. All right, let's talk about the recruitment process. Uh, if uh, someone wanted to apply for a job as a programmer or developer uh, with you guys, what is it that you're looking for? What kind of skills they need to have? Uh, you know, what was the recruitment process like? It's portfolio based, very, very heavily portfolio based, and I would recommend to anybody wanting to to get in, get into the industry in in the development side of things, you need to actually be able to demonstrate your chops. Um, 
the, the last developer that, that I was involved in the hiring process uh, basically came with a demo of a multiplayer space shooter that they had made. And you could actually point at it and go, I made this. So you can tell that they have demonstrable skills um, right there. The the flip side, you know, if we're not talking about developing as in, as in coding or um, if you're talking about visual arts, you need to have a good visual portfolio as well. You need to be able to demonstrate your art style. That's something that the the creative directors hire based on your your style. They want someone whose style is going to mesh neatly with with their own, or someone who has a versatile style and shows that they're adaptable. Um, from a from a, a community and product point of view, um, speaking from from my own experience, um, get in the community and be active, and don't be frightened to put your hand up. Um, that's the reason that I'm, I'm here, I actually do have a background in software development. Most people don't know about, but um, I, I have done, <laughs> I have done, I done software support and software development lifecycle support uh, many, many moons ago. But um, the reason that I'm working with Kluge is because I put my hand up and said I can, and I think that's probably the most important thing for people who are interested in community management or getting closer into the development side of things. Put your hand up, be a tester get involved in beta testing programs. And, and when you do it, you know, be a good team player. That, that's the hardest thing to learn is to be, a, to be a team player. So it's a really important skill for you to bring forward. So if you're looking yeah. for more marketing people to join your team, do they need to have an experience in VR? Uh, what, what is it that you look for? Yes, in our case, it's, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a huge benefit to have a, a, an experience in VR. Not at least own a headset and be uh, an active player. Um, but yeah, this is quite specific. And since we are going to stick to developing VR uh, games, um, this is important to, to have this background. Final uh, question. Yeah. Sorry. F final question. Um, you guys use Unity for, for uh, synth writers. Are you looking to continuously use Unity? Are you looking to jump to Unreal? Uh, if you're not using Unreal, why not? I believe we're going to be staying with Unity because we have a considerable amount of experience in Unity and the team is pretty comfortable with, with Unity uh, and particularly porting Unity across to all of the platforms that, uh, that we're on. Will um, OpenXR change everything for you? Will you use OpenXR? I think we probably will wind up going down the OpenXR path. Um, will, it, will it change things for us? Um, I don't know. Our, our, our current IP is a bit of a basket case in that, that you know, that we already run a unified binary for both Steam and Oculus platforms. It is a unified binary. So um, where we really do believe in cross-platform. That is something we believe in a great deal and we've, we've essentially made everything we've done cross-platform and, and open. I'm, I'm the, the number one fan of open standards. So um, I would definitely like to see us go down the open XR path uh, down the track for sure. Cool. Do you guys want to add anything uh, that you freely would like to add to today's uh, talk? I would like to take this occasion to like, if there are any people who already own Sint Riders uh, among the audience, um, and especially on PlayStation VR, which is a new platform. Uh, welcome and, and, and thank you. Uh, this is, um, it's, it's not only like we are community driven. I also think uh, that we are fueled uh, by being able to, to interact with, with the players uh, and having the, the, the fun base um, and just making people happy. Um, and hearing from them. So, uh, thank you. Definitely. I, I could not support that statement anymore, anymore, Paul. Um, yeah. Hello, everybody. <laughs> it's good to see you. <laughs> if you're, if you're a synth writers player, or even if you're not a synth writers player, um, you know, come and, come and join us. Um, it's not illegal to like more than one game. That's my rule. And the more games you play, the, the happier your body is. Um, Personally, like I'm a big fan of O Shape. I play O Shape and I play Synth Riders and I play Audio Shield as my my three main rhythm games that I that I enjoy. And I'm better for having played more than one game. So I would encourage everybody who wants to look after your body long term, um, 
play more than one game and and enjoy sharing the fun. And Lazarus, thank you so much for having us here and uh, for all your amazing questions. It's been really, really good to think <laughs> through this stuff together. So thank you for the opportunity to to, to talk to you as well. You're Very welcome. Thoughtful. And I, ha- I have a bonus question, which is, uh, did, did, you, did you develop your own plugins uh, with Unity when you were trying to port the games on different platforms to get the controllers to work properly? Because I heard that was actually one of the biggest issues for a lot of developers. Uh, just want to understand the process here uh, for you guys before we, we, we leave today's call. Yeah, I believe we did. I, be, I don't think we did anything magical around it. I think we just used, we used what we had provided. Um, I don't think Jan did anything magical. Um, I, and I have to say, oh, I was quite shocked at how well the PlayStation Move controllers worked. Um, there were the first, the first port that I played, uh, I've got the, the, the test kit, the first port that I played on the test kit, I was like, mm, I'm not sure about this. Um, need to refine a couple of things here, um, but actually, I really quite enjoy them as, as a set of controllers. They've got some very unique attributes that none of the other systems have. You mean um, the new controllers? No, the, the, ra- the no, round the shaped ones. ones? No, oh, the, the old, old ones. ones. Okay. Yep. Right. You know the benefit of the old ones. Unlike pretty much every other VR controller that I've got, there's mm-hmm. no ring on the end of them. So when you bring your hands together in that synth rider's unique way, which is the gold note, um, yeah, right. The hands come together. No bruising. It's fantastic. Soft, soft on the top. If you happen to smash your hands, it, it doesn't leave a mark. It's brilliant. They're actually surprisingly comfortable to play with. And um, yeah, I, I actually quite enjoy playing on the PSVR version um, a lot more than I thought perhaps I would. Um, it's an incredibly comfortable headset and the, the port is actually really a lot of fun to play. So, yeah. Right. Okay. Well, guys, thanks again for having you on the call. Really appreciate it. Take Thank care. You. And if you need anything, let me know. I'm, I'm in Singapore, so I'm in between you two. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, if, you, if you need any help or you just want to say hi, whatever, um, my door is always open to, to you guys. So thank you very much. Thank you so much.